I really appreciate you all being here. Uh, this is my first time at SCALE. It's been uh, one of the best conferences that I've been to, so it's really cool to see the level of the folks and the engagement of people who are technologists who are looking to learn about new technology and are bringing their experience uh, with existing technologies. Um, in fact, I had to update my slide deck for a higher level of understanding because I think a lot of the folks here are uh, are more advanced than uh, what my previous slide deck was. So bear with me if there are some glitches, but uh, I think everything will be fine. Um, the good news is that uh, this presentation is so good that my friend Rob in the back has come to see it again. Yes, thank you. Um, and he's giving a presentation on Service Mesh later today as well at 3. So uh, I will be in there, and uh, it'll be, um, I can't wait to see what he's bringing. So with that, let's talk about Service Meshes. Who here is familiar with Service Mesh? Great. Uh, who wants to know more about Service Mesh? Good. Yes. OK. Um, and that's why we're here today, to talk about those things. So uh, if throughout this, pre or this talk, I want to make it more of a dialogue. If you have questions, feel free to. We'll certainly have time at the end. Um, but if you have questions during the talk, then please just uh, raise your hand, and we'll pause, because uh, as you know, oftentimes people have the same question. Um, yeah, so we'll dive in. Uh, so some of you are familiar with Service Mesh. Uh, who here has used Kubernetes or is using Kubernetes? Anybody in production? All right. Anybody using a Service Mesh in production? OK, that's OK. Um, because there are some things that uh, I think are important to understand. And for me, just to get to Kubernetes in production in a real production environment, I think takes a tremendous amount of learning curve. And so when I first started learning about service meshes, uh, specifically with Istio, and um, I used to work at Nginx, and we tried to build our own service mesh when I was there. It's, there's rumors in the service mesh community that they're building a, one of their own as well now. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they come out with. Um, but this was probably almost 18 months ago, and I was when I first started learning about Service Mesh, I was still ramping up on Kubernetes, trying to understand, get my, my mind wrapped around that. And then somebody comes in and says, well, now that you've got Kubernetes running, or you, you have some small understanding of Kubernetes, let's talk about putting this other thing on top of it. And I was like, let's pump the brakes. We've got to slow down here a little bit, because this is too much. It's too much for my little brain to handle. So gave you a little bit of background. My name is Charles. Email me, Slack me. Uh, you can tw hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I'm available for questions or anything like that. I'm not going to go into the boring background of my career. Um, and personally, I think that's a more fun to com conversation to have over a beer, because then I get to know you all as well. So. Uh, we'll talk about the favorite question, and this is the new part uh, that I've added. Uh, we'll go over, do I need a service mesh? Uh, service, then we'll dive into service mesh basics. I'll, do, I'll show you an installation of Linkerd, um, some of the features that it provides for you based off of service mesh concepts. And um, if there's time, I'll throw in a couple of other things. And along the way, I will probably uh, ramble a lot, so I'll try to keep myself focused. So do I need a service mesh? Uh, this is a question that we get a lot. Um, and I can tell you, nope. Uh, this is what my wife tells. This is how I'm told uh, you pronounce nope emphatically. Uh, this is what my wife says when I tell her that I would like a new television. Noop, and my sister, who is a speech pathologist, tells me that this is the proper way to spell noop. So uh, I trust all these people implicitly. So why do I say that? Why are we even talking about this, this, uh, this, this software that you would, that you might want to add to your application? Like, what does it bring? So 
yeah, why all the fuss? A service mesh is a concept that abstracts additional work uh, of implementing and in instrumenting your application for observability, security, reliability, and traffic management. That's a lot of words on a slide. I'm a picture guy, so this is the graphical res representation of that, right? So who here is an application developer? Okay, and then infrastructure folks? Yep, that makes sense. And uh, who have I missed? Op cluster operators, sysadmins? So I come from a, an application development background, uh, building monolithic applications. And as I've had experience with uh, instrumenting my code with things like New Relic, uh, other APM tools, and the, the thing is, it's entirely possible to write your code in such a way that you get all of the value that I just mentioned, observability, uh, reliability, security, and traffic management. The thing is, your developers have to be aware of that. That means you're adding libraries in, you are instrumenting, maybe you're annotating code. Um, it, it adds lines of code to what you really want, which is the business logic. So the service mesh is a layer of abstraction. We, and so we hear the, this, this is a term that I hear probably 800 times a week. That's an exaggeration, maybe, maybe 700. But layer of abstraction, we're talking about this all the time, especially with uh, infrastructure like Kubernetes. And I'm sorry this mic is scratchy. I, don't, I think maybe if I pull it out a little bit. Okay, see if that works. So um, what we've done is we've taken, because we've got a layer, there's networking that's happening. Regardless of you, whether you have a, a service mesh, or not, your services require traffic in order to perform the business logic and provide responses to the people who are making requests in there. So uh, the service mesh adds this layer so that you don't have to add additional code to your business logic. Uh, this is uh, what we, talk, we, we refer to as transparency. I think that's pretty standard uh, across the industry. So. Um, the notion of the service mesh came out of the breaking down of the monolithic application at Twitter. I'm old enough to remember when, in late 2000s, when Twitter had this thing called the fail whale. Anybody here remember that as well? So uh, that was a fun time. Um, and some of the folks who built Linkerd worked on the infrastructure and applications team at Twitter during that time. So as they were breaking down the monolith into a more service-oriented architecture, they realized that it's great you've got a more reliable, more stable system uh, because you have these different pieces that are now communicating with each other instead of one large monolithic application that you have to scale horizontally in order to manage the amount of traffic that's coming in. So as they were building this out, they said, this is, this is really good, but we need a few things. We need to understand which parts of the, the health of the, the other parts of the distributed system. So not which parts are failing, which parts are succeeding. The health of the application of, as a whole is defined by the health of its individual parts. And so as a result, uh, one of the things that the team needed to understand is how is each service performing? What are those, those metrics? And, what we came, what came to be defined later as the golden metrics. So we've got um, latency, throughput, or yeah, request per second, latency, uh, error success rates, and so this information becomes very important to understand. And again, these are things that you can build into your business logic and have that information uh, sent somewhere so that it can be collected later. The idea behind the service mesh is well. If we're, we have all this traffic coming in anyway, uh, let's put something, a proxy, in between the services that can then collect that telemetry and send it to a place, uh, not just telemetry, um, that can send it to a place and, so that we can collect it. And uh, in addition to that, we started seeing things like security. So maybe you need uh, encrypted traffic even behind the firewall. We talk a lot about zero trust networks these days, and so um, this is where things like MTLS come in. And then also load balancing. 
if you've got a large number of instances of a single service, uh, you want to make sure that the traffic is evenly distributed across those so that one doesn't get overloaded and then you get yourself into another fail whale type of situation. Does that all make sense? Is that, okay. Um, is this all, is this stuff that you know already? Should I speed through this a little more? Okay. So, uh, service mesh basics. Uh, I've already talked about the four main tenets that the team developed or uh, thought of when they were, as they were writing the application. So observability, security, reliability, and traffic management. The observability piece is really important because it talks about collecting those golden metrics and specifically making them actionable, understanding when your requests are failing, uh, where they're failing, how you can uh, react to them. And so the goal here is to reduce uh, mean time to detection and mean time to resolution. Security is a piece that uh, and we see a lot of banks and telecom industries who require uh, secure communication even behind the firewall. It's important for them to be able to uh, encrypt that traffic behind, uh, encrypt that traffic so that even if somebody's on the network, uh, they, it's secure, they can't just sit there and sniff packets and read all the data that's coming through. Reliability talks about uh, retries and timeouts, making sure that the, the uh, services themselves are healthy. And it also speaks to load balancing, that situation that I mentioned where if you have multiple instances of a service, you want to evenly distribute that load or distribute that load using a, a smart algorithm that's going to not overwhelm one or more of the services and just give you that smooth curve of traffic. And then traffic management, uh, we, it's uh, really just talking about routing based off of specific rules. Uh, where we see this and where we've begun to implement this uh, for Linkerd is specifically with splitting traffic, which then allows you to do uh, blue-green deployments or canary deployments of your application or of your services. So as I mentioned before, transparency is key. That abstracting that proxy out now puts the onus of collecting those metrics uh, and routing the traffic on the proxy itself. And so now you have much cleaner business logic and your developers don't have to worry about uh, where do I send data dog metrics or anything like that. So what is a service mesh? Uh, typically, we see a diagram like this. When we talk about a distributed system, you've got service A, B, and C. They communicate with each other, and the traffic comes in, and everything goes around. This is uh, the reality of it is that we have a much more complex application where we have services that are communicating with databases, with external APIs, and we have multiple instances of these services. Uh, we have some, some uh, those of you running Kubernetes in production who has more than uh, 100 services? You do. Great. Um, how many pods does that end up being? What's that? A thousand? OK, yeah. And so we've seen as few as 100 pods and as many as like 4,000. So it gets really interesting when you get into these complex environments. Um, people often ask me, the second question that I get about do you need a service mesh or do I need a service mesh is um, okay, so let's say that I've decided that I need one, when is the right time to implement one? And my experience has been when you get to that uh, 9 to 12 uh, number of services that you, that you actually have, once you get past that level, it becomes very difficult for um, any single team or multiple engineering teams to be able to really fully grok the amount of traffic that's coming in to respond quickly to uh, a bad rollout. So speaking of bad rollouts, the again, one of the functions of the service mesh is to reduce mean time to detection. And so let's say, uh, well, I forgot about this slide. So when everything's working, you're making money. This is, uh, I live in San Francisco. This is what I'm told that a successful startup looks like. So uh, just printing money. Somebody made the comment once, like, 
why do you use one dollar bills shouldn't they be hundred dollar bills I don't know it's just the uh, that's that's the default emoji for for packets of money so um, but the reality of it is failures occur we need to be prepared for them so uh, if your database begins to spin up and go on fire uh, we need to understand that and how that impacts other services. Perhaps this external API begins to fail and uh, or you've reached a rate limit uh, and now your service Y needs to be able to handle that gracefully. Or you release a new version and it turns out that it doesn't perform as well as you want it to. Um, I may or may not have been guilty of doing this once, um, but the good news is with the proper tools in place, we can detect these things. And again, the reality of this is some of these things can happen all at once or in combination. And uh, it's important to be able to understand that to, to get down to a point where you can drill down to the problem, say this is what we need to fix, and roll out a fix very quickly. So the real, um, when we go back to that basic example, uh, a service mesh consists of two parts. We've got the data plane and the control plane. The data plane is uh, proxies that are injected or sit alongside each of the services and handle traffic to those, uh, between it, uh, those services. What we see now is that the services themselves no longer directly communicate with each other. They, all the communication happens from the proxy. And this is how we can begin to collect things like the telemetry, the uh, latency, requests, uh, success and error rates, um, and also begin to discover our service topology. So service discovery is a big, uh, a big topic in distributed systems. And the most simple example of that is when you have a single service with multiple instances and you scale up that service because you've got more traffic, you now begin to have to understand uh, the IP addresses or the names of those services so that the traffic can be load balanced across those. The second part, is, as I mentioned, is the control plane. The Linkerd control plane uh, consists of seven or eight services now. Among those are services for components for collecting telemetry, for um, generating certificates for service discovery and for making the telemetry that's collected human readable. Uh, okay, so I'll do an install of Linkerd. I'll walk you through it through the slides first and then I'll, it'll make sense when I'm entering the commands. The, the Linkerd installation, there are two parts to it. There's the CLI, which is designed uh, just like cube control. So if you're using kubectl, cube control, however you want to call it, um, it should be familiar to you. It's a binary that can be used to interact with your cluster. And, and, and these are the components that I mentioned. So we've got identity, the API, um, and those, uh, the proxy API is used to configure the data plane, each of the proxies as they come up. So again, when a new instance of a service or a new service is added to your application, the injection of the proxy, or the proxy is injected in there, but we have to know how to configure it. It has to know um, what its certificate is. It has to get that certificate from the trust authority. Uh, it has to know where to send metrics. So there are a, a bunch of different pieces there that have to be done when the proxy is started. So when I do the installation, I'll, do, I'll check to make sure if my cluster is healthy. I'll do the installation of the control plane. Um, these are commands for the commands for doing this based on Linux and Windows. Uh, so installing the CLI, I already have it installed, so we won't have to pull it down. When I do the control plane installation, again, I'll check, I'll do a pre-check, which makes sure that I can do things like create resources, read namespaces, um, various activities that are required for the control plane to function properly. After that, I will install a demonstration application and I will inject that with the Linkerd pod so that we can begin to collect the telemetry. The injection is handled, it's uh, auto injection. So we have an annotation that goes onto a namespace, a deployment, 
uh, stateful set, any of your Kubernetes resources, that uh, there's a uh, what we call the proxy injector. It's a mutating webhook controller which reads the annotation and determines whether the proxy should be injected into the pod. And we'll see how that works as well. There's a dashboard which is, uh, anybody here work with a suit? I work with, I used to work with a bunch of suits. Now I work with a bunch of hoodies. The suits are the, to me are the people who like nice clean dashboards, table, tabular layouts with UIs and, and uh, lots of colors and, and real time activity. We'll take a look at that. Um, it's actually a very useful thing to look at uh, for your application as a whole. We, everything that is available, all the telemetry that's available on the dashboard is also available through the command line interface and I'll show you some of that as well. So, uh, with that, are there any questions before I jump in? Okay, uh, I have running locally a kind uh, cluster, single node kind cluster. Is anybody using kind Kubernetes and Docker? It's pretty, it's, it's fast, it's easy, you can tear it down. It's great for local development. So, um, we'll take a look at all the pods in the cluster. And we can, can you all read that okay? So make it a little bigger. So we can see that the only thing that's running there are the cube system pieces. So uh, I have Linkerd installed already. I'm gonna use the latest stable version. We do edge releases once a week. Um, so if I do Linkerd version, again, this should look a lot like uh, the output from cube control. Uh, so linkerd check dash dash pre. It's going to go through and look at the cluster to make sure that all the resources that it needs are available. So things like it can create config, config maps, it can create secrets. Um, we use IP tables, so we need to be able to have net admin and net raw capabilities as well. <coughs> So everything looks good there, that is great. There, again, so let's take a look at, oops. The linkerd command, you can see, again, it's, there are several sub-commands that we can run. The next one that I'm going to run is linkerd install. And all that's gonna do for me is generate a bunch of YAML. This is the deployments, the config maps, the cluster roles, cluster role bindings, all the resources that it needs in order to run the application. So nothing's been done now. If we look at the pods in the cluster, again. So if I do linkerd install, and one thing I wanna show you is that I'm running more in a dev mode here. There is a, an HA mode, and this does really interesting things like creates three replicas of each of the control plane components. It adds uh, request resources, or resource requests and limits to the Linkerd proxy. And uh, those are the main things that it does. So again, I'm just gonna run this in dev mode. And we'll see that it's doing things like creating the deployments, service accounts, again, all the resources that you need. So now we can run Linkerd check. Well, before I do that, let's look at, we'll get the pods in the Linkerd namespace. So this has gone in and created an, a Linkerd namespace. And we can see that the pods there are all, they're getting ready to run. So um, if I do the Linkerd check command, this is gonna go through and rerun that check, but now expecting Linkerd control plane to have been installed. If you run this check command with Linkerd already installed, it fails. Uh, it says it's already, or sorry, um, if you run the Linkerd check pre command with Linkerd installed, it will fail. So now we see <coughs> the control plane is all started up and uh, all my pods are running. We have two of two and I'll show you why that is in just one second. So uh, I've started the Linkerd dashboard and it's opened in a different desktop. But I happen to know that it runs at localhost 50.5.0.7.5.0. Oh, I can't even read that. Oops. Where'd it go? Uh, oops. 
localhost. There we go. Okay. So I showed you, I mentioned that Linkerd has a, there are two containers running in each pod, and that's because Linkerd itself runs Linkerd. Straight away, we're getting telemetry out of Linkerd, uh, the control plane, so that we know the health of the control plane. We want to make sure that we're collecting telemetry there. Uh, just as a quick side note, we have our own Grafana dashboards that are shipped with Linkerd, so that if you're using Grafana, if this is, uh, if you need these graphs, Grafana pulls metrics from an instance of Prometheus that is also deployed with Linkerd. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, we have Linkerd installed. We can see the other namespaces. Now what I want to do is, um, and I'd like to do this in a way that you can see the dashboard and the CLI at the same time, which means I need to do some window juggling. Uh, we'll go back into the dashboard. Okay, right. Um, namespaces, great. Okay, so I'm going to install a sample application uh, that we use for demonstration purposes. It's called Books App, and it's a very simple application that keeps track of all your books. Um, okay, so one of the things I want you to see here, and the reason that I put these windows side by side is, um, oh, I didn't inject the namespace like I was supposed to. Um, let's look at our namespaces. I have default, so. I'm going to use Kube control to annotate this namespace. And one thing that we'll see here, though, is that the default namespace now has six deployments in it already. They're just not meshed. Um, annotate default, linkerd.io, inject is enabled. Oop, I forgot. To, okay, that's okay. What I want I also want to show you that the names, well, yeah, the default namespace has nothing in it. Specifically, there are no annotations on it. So if we go back and I actually annotate this properly, we can now see that this annotation's been enabled. Since my application was already deployed, uh, I have to restart my deployments in order to get the mutating webhook controller to pick up this annotation. So if I do kube control rollout, restart deploy, we'll see that the deployments are being restarted. And again, straight away, as soon as those traf traffic starts hitting those proxies, we're getting this telemetry. We can see immediately that in the default namespace, uh, we're getting traffic. Um, the, this all happens like very, very fast, uh, which is why I wanted to put these two windows together. Uh, there's a traffic generator service that is sending traffic to the web app, which then communicates with books and authors. Uh, we can see that if we go to, uh, I lost my, let's see, oh, I know why. If we go to a smaller version, there should be a squid map. Oh, here we go, there it is. So this shows us the communication between the services, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the proxy, because it's handling all the traffic, allows you to get the edges between the services. I also mentioned that all of this is available in the command line interface, so if we do Linkerd edge um, deploy, we should see edges. Um, we can see the communication between each of these, the edges between each of these services. And so this is a tabular representation of the same graphical map. But that's not as interesting as something like Linkerd stat, where we can go and say, um, show me the statistics for all of the deployments. So again, this information, 80.6% success rate, the latencies, these timings, they're all being collected from the proxies and put into a short-term Prometheus store. Okay, um, any questions on that? Okay, um, there's another command. Again, we're, we're looking to reduce mean time to um, 
detection. And so uh, there is linkerd cap command, which is just like um, TCP dump. So if you can read this, that's great. But what we're seeing here is the traffic between all of the pods. The command that I ran was linkerd tap PO, which is pods. Um, we see all the traffic going to between the pods. And so this allows us to see uh, more granular detail about each of the requests that's going through. So that is how we install Linkerd. I think that's everything. Um, there, again, there are other commands. I did edges. Oh, routes. That's one. That's going to become important in a second. So if I do Linkerd routes, on deploy web app, uh, I can see that I have one route. Uh, it's just for um, the default route. This is good, but it's not. We can get. We can do better than this. We can see the at a granular level, the requests, all of these metrics for the um, for each of the routes. And so the way that we accomplish this is through the one CRD that Linkerd has called service profiles. Service profiles, I'll show you one of them. Um, it's in projects. Nope. Uh, I have it somewhere else. Well, oh yeah, Swagger. So we can do, uh, actually let's do web app. So web app, uh, are you all familiar with open a the open API spec swagger files? So we have here defined a bunch of paths in our swagger file. And what we can do is take this file um, is web app, service web app. I think that'll do it. Nope. Um, let's see, open API. Oh, I got the file in the wrong place. Protofile. Yeah, I have the file in the wrong place. This is, oh, this is the one I'm looking for. Okay. Oops. Still didn't get it right. What's the service name? It's web app. File. Oops. There we go. Um, what am I doing wrong here? Oh, I see it. There we go. Okay. So what's that? It's consumed that. Um, Swagger file and has created this service profile resource that we can then use to get more granular metrics from each route. So if I apply that, it creates that resource. And now when I go back to the routes command, um, I can see that I now have more of these routes. And as the telemetry comes in, we'll be able to, uh, if we watch this, uh, oh, we've already got the telemetry there. So we can see that there are some routes that are failing and some that are successful. And uh, this, again, helps us to d get to that mean, mean time to detection, reduce mean time to detection. Um, OK, so does that all make sense? Any, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's, uh, so the, there's linkerd upgrade command. And if I weren't running the the current version, so this is this will try and install stable 2.7.0. Um, you know what we can do though is install the edge version. And now, if I do linkerd version, um, the reason that it still says that is because all of the pods are restarting. 
after the the upgrade command. So yeah, and if you do that in HA mode, it'll do the a rolling restart so that you have no downtime. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We only have one CRD. We yeah exactly we well and again that's one of the design tenets from the folks who are who write Linkerd. I'm I'm a maintainer on Linkerd, but the people who designed and architected the the app the software, they they want it to be zero config, uh, lightweight, easy to use, and this is all based off of their experiences of managing all of the applications at Twitter. Not all of the applications, but a lot of the applications at Twitter. So now if I do Linkerd check. I should see that the, oops, not check, Linkerd version. I should see, yeah, so the server version is this edge release, so we've just upgraded it. Um, the, yeah, so there are a couple of caveats to that. Uh, one is that when we do this development, mo development mode, I haven't talked about security as much as I should. Um, there is a certificate authority that is generated that is created with Linkerd and it creates a trust anchor and that trust anchor is used to sign certificate signing requests from the proxies. So to go the other direction from that, when a proxy is injected into a pod, it creates a certificate signing request. It sends that request to the trust anchor, the identity service, and then it gets a certificate back. And that's how we establish mutual TLS between each of the, the pods. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so the caveat that I mentioned is this is a development certificate. It's self-signed, it's, it's not something you would use in production. What we do have with uh, Linkerd install is, uh, and this is when we do a pr an actual production and um, deployment, we have these flags here that you can specify your own certificate you can specify your own key and your own trust anchors file, which is the recommended way of doing it. In addition to that, with this release, we've, um, we've got support for Cert Manager. Is anybody using Cert Manager or heard of Cert Manager? Uh, for, if you haven't heard of it, it is a project written by the JetStack folks, which is meant to manage all of your certificates inside of your Kubernetes cluster. So by using Cert Manager, Linkerd can um, get its trust anchor sorry, it's certificate, which is used to generate the trust anchor from cert manager. So it eases the burden of having to specify these flags. I should also mention that if you're using Helm, there are Helm charts that will do this for you as well. So again, it's meant to be lightweight, zero config, and th there, there are some things you have to take in co into consideration as well, though. Okay, um, any other questions before we go on? Yeah, yep. MTL MTLS is by default, and eventually, probably end of the year, it'll be mandatory. Uh, before we get to that, we're working on MTLS for TCP. Right now, we have MTLS just for HTTP. That's a good question. Uh, we use an init con container to do the IP table, to manage the IP table. So the proxy itself doesn't manage the IP tables, only the init container does. Um, and that for now is a, uh, well the init con container will always be there. Um, we're, we're pushing very hard on getting the sidecar um, container spec gone, gone through. Have you all, are you all familiar with that one? There's a spec for Kubernetes um, to have a sidecar type resource, a sidecar container, just like an ephemeral container, which was released uh, two versions ago, I think, or, or an init container, which has been around forever. Sidecar container guarantees that your sidecar starts before your business logic and finishes after your business logic. So that's supposed to land in 119, 1.19. Okay. Um, so the reason that we did service profiles is because, let's take a look, oops, I keep doing that, and I lost my slides somehow. That's okay though. Um, the service profile will give us uh, those individual route metrics. And so when we take a look at, oh, my dashboard shut down. There we go. 
Okay. Um, so when we go to the web app service, we again we see that there's some reds there, and the suits don't like red, so we got to fix that. Um, what we can do is add retries and timeouts. Specifically, let's see, this is not. Uh, so if we go to Cube Control uh, Service Profile. So we'll take this one, we'll edit it, and on this one I think we want to do, um, let's see, this is in my slides, let me, I don't want to mess this up. Sorry about this. I lost my slide window somehow. Present. Okay, so fast forward to retries and timeouts. Uh, again, we talked about the service profiles. Um, I walked you through getting them. Uh, so the time, the, the what we want to add here is the timeout value. And this will, this is a defined in milliseconds and it allows us to, based on the health of our, if we expect our application to, one of our services to respond more slowly, specifically that route that I just added it to, oops, let's see, there we go. So this book slash edit route, the timeout is now, um, uh, 25 milliseconds. So what that means is when we go down and look at the service, let's see, web app, route metrics. Um, so I've added that what we should see here is that this success rate should start to go up. So it, it should come as no surprise that this sample application has some errors built into it or some latencies built into it so that we can demonstrate the, the performance. Um, so that should start to go up. Yep, there it goes. And that's, oh, that went down. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm commentating on a dashboard. How fun is that? Um, so again, we have these retries and these timeouts, which allow us to give us, uh, allow us control over specific routes and the performance of each one. The default timeout, by the way, for every route is 10 milliseconds. And again, it's configurable. Okay, let's move on. What am I doing on time? 15 minutes. Okay, um, I showed you tap a little bit. We can dive into that a little bit more. So the, the thing that I showed you with tap is that it was just a bunch of, um, if I do linkerd tap PO, that's gonna tap all of the pods communicating with each other in each inside of our application. And so um, while it's, helpful, it's a ton of information, and we want to be able to um, to filter it. So let's look at our deployments, and let's say we just want to understand the traffic that's going between uh, web app and books. So if we can do linkerd tap, deploy web app, dash two, deploy books. And this now is moving much slower, um, and that's only because what we're seeing is specific traffic between the pods for just those two deployments. If I scaled up the pods, it would, we would see more traffic, um, and I could also specifically target each pod, so if I wanted to look at the traffic just between two pods, that allows, uh, I, can, I can issue that command with pod names here instead of the actual deployments. Um, Okay, so again, this all ties back into, this is where I kind of ramble a little bit because I, I really enjoy digging into like all, being able to get all the, this information and extract this, uh, this detail of, of debugging and performance and metrics from an application. This all ties back into 
the observability, the security piece that you mentioned, we talked about um, MTLS and how those certificates are issued, how you can use your own certificates, and uh, reliability. I haven't touched on load balancing much. So load, Kubernetes by default has HTTP load balancing. Linkerd uses an estimated weight distributed algorithm, or estimated weight moving average, estimated weighted moving average algorithm, EWMA. And what this does is, as we're collecting the metrics from each of the pods, the latencies specifically, we look at which are, which are the slowest, and that moves into some math that is way over my head, and the proxy then uses that to determine how to load balance the next request. Um, again, Kubernetes has HTTP round robin load balancing by default, so it, it might work, it might not. You may have a, a very finicky application that needs a finer grained uh, app, uh, algorithm for load balancing. In addition, Linkerd does gRPC load balancing as well. So as we see more applications being developed using gRPC and protocol buffers, um, this becomes very relevant. So yeah, that was load balancing, so observability, observability, reliability, security, and then the last piece is traffic management, and um, I don't, oh, I did have a slide, but it was at the beginning. So the traffic management piece is, again, we're talking about being able to do um, splitting traffic. We use, is anybody familiar with the service mesh interface? Okay. It's a, it's a project that was developed, announced almost a year ago by uh, a joint project between Microsoft, HashiCorp, Buoyant, um, which is the main sponsor for Linkerd. That's where I work. Um, uh, I'm missing somebody. Aspen Mesh was involved. And um, so the goal is to define a specific standard for metrics and telemetry and other aspects that the any service mesh emits so that you can build applications on top of it. And so the first piece that we have implemented of that is the traffic split, which allows us to send traffic, uh, as you would expect, based on weight to one version of a service versus another version of a service. Um, and again, this is useful for canary deployments and uh, um, blue-green deployments. Something that we're working on that just came out in the Edge release, and I, I, I was staying up late last night and early this morning trying to get the demo to work. It's, uh, it's an experimental feature right now, but uh, we are implementing what we call service mirroring, which is what allows us to do multi-cluster support which is really, really cool. I'm very excited about it, and I'm very bummed that I didn't get to show it to you today. Um, hopefully, in the next release, it'll become a little more, uh, there's just no documentation around it. It works. Um, I just I had to ping a bunch of my colleagues last night to, to try and get it configured and up and running. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. So um, we, are, I think, are... I want to give time for more questions if there are any, and I did run through a lot of that quite quickly. Are there, are there any questions? Okay. If not, then this is where I get to do my shameless plugs for the Linkerd community. I am heavily involved in the Linkerd community. This is why I'm here doing these talks. Um, that's how I got to meet Rob and Tempe. Um, the community is, we're active on Slack. It's, again, Linkerd is an open source project wholly owned by the CNCF. We don't, uh, we're the main contributors to it. We are always looking for folks who want to help us build features, uh, looking for feedback for, for users. Um, I'm always on Slack. You can hit me up anytime and I'm usually, I'll respond within 10 or 15 minutes, um, unless my wife says, nope, and then I don't get to be on Slack. But uh, yeah, so there's the Linkerd community, and then um, also we're hiring at Buoyant. We're looking for SREs, so if anybody's curious, check out buoyant.io and see some of the things we're working on. Um, egregious slide with lots of marketing stuff on it, doesn't matter. and. 
I think that's it. So, 10 minutes early. If there are no questions, then, uh, oh, there we go. So when you say you're saying scaling, oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question is, how does Linkerd scale? What's the latency for the control plane? Um, the performance is really good. I don't have any slides to show you, um, but I can tell you it's gotten better because I mentioned that we have um, some folks that have upwards of a thousand or two thousand pods, or one one company in particular had 4,000 and they found that the instance of, so Linkerd comes with a short-term memory only Prometheus deployment. And so that's where the metrics are meant to be temporarily stored and then you consume them by a production, a, a much larger installation of Prometheus. And you can imagine that many uh, pods sending that much telemetry to a an instance of Prometheus that stores six hours of data, which it's configurable, and they configured it as much as they could. Um, and again, they ended up having a, their Prometheus machine runs like a terabyte of memory. It's massive. Um, so it is, uh, it, it's, it scales well, and it's scaling better, and we're always looking at performance. In fact, I should go back and say, one of the reasons that it's so lightweight, one of the reasons that it doesn't have as many features as Istio is because we're, the team is focused solely on performance and ease of use and user experience. Um, and as we add features in, we make sure that our benchmarks are all met and that the application doesn't become bloated or the control plane doesn't slow down and affect your application. Ooh, well, that one I do have a slide for. Um, there was an independent, uh, and this is actually a blog post run by the folks at Kinvolk. Um, this is an independent third-party analysis of Istio and Linkerd. Granted, this was almost a year ago, so it was before Mixer was pulled out of Istio and um, before, it, well, they're, they're still working on making the Istio control plane a, a monolith now, which is fun. but. Um, Somewhere around here, there's some shiny graphs. Okay, so we have latency percentiles. What we see is that Linkerd um, always outperforms um, Istio, even when it's tuned. So initially, the first test that they ran, they didn't, they hadn't tuned Istio. Well, actually, they ran two tests. One was out of the box, and one was tuned. And in both cases, Linkerd performed better. Um, I, I'll make sure that everybody gets this uh, somehow. I think there's some place that I can upload my slides. But um, yeah, there is independent measurements of Istio versus Linkerd talking about performance. Um, and this is, this is the slide that my CEO likes me to show off. Uh, so, well, there are a number of differentiations, and in fact, uh, we are starting to communicate. This is a really good question. Uh, I'm going to take a step back for a minute. Um, we get this question all the time, right? And I think one of the questions that makes me laugh is, like, how does Linkerd perform against Envoy? Well, I don't know. Envoy is not a service mesh. Uh, so, the Again, the philosophy was to be lightweight, perform, uh, highly performant. Um, it's, we are just now starting communication about, uh, and the reason I pulled up a blank browser tab is because we just added to our docs, like, what is Linkerd versus Istio? And I, I, I know that if I Google Linkerd, Linkerd versus Istio, it's not going to give you the doc that I want. So we're, we're identifying. Um, Really, it's what's the right tool for the right job. And I'm going to take a, the step back that I want to take is that I think a lot of us were, uh, were scarred by what was known as the orchestration wars. And Kubernetes won, and yay, we're all wearing blue and naming things after Greek boats or using Greek to name things. Um, the, the service mesh 
category for us is not a war. It's a beauty pageant or, uh, you know, it's, it's a dance off, right? Um, and so the reason that I mention that is because uh, we don't think it's a winner take all category. And in fact, I'll be doing some presentations with the folks at Aspen Mesh and Console and um, just to talk about, yeah, this is, we think, a useful piece of software. Um, and you should use the one that's right for you. So um, people who are using GKE, Istio is probably a good fit for you because you can get it managed. Managed Istio, managed Istio is great. If you don't have to flip all the levers and switches, that's fantastic. If you're a heavy HashiCore product user, and console is probably the thing that you want to, console connect specifically is what you want to build in. So, um, yeah, and for folks who are on AKS or, or don't want to use App Mesh um, on EKS or who are running their own clusters, something like Linkerd is easy to install, try out, tear out if it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, it's it, the difference, there are quite a few. One of the things that we are, we see as being very important is the governance. And so Istio and Knative are being managed by Google. They will not, Google will not be donating, donating them to the CNCF. Uh, Linkerd, its proxy, its control plane is entirely, it, CNCF owns it. We don't, <laughs> we don't own any part of it. So that's important to us to make sure that it's an open community that's working on it that meets their, again, building software that helps people be successful. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, and I could, if, we, if you want to go get a beer, we can talk about it some more. But yeah, it's, we get that a lot. Um, and it's, it's an interesting topic. One of the things that I, uh, and I'll stop rambling after this, I promise. Um, one of the things that I've observed over the last uh, four or five cube cons that I've been to is the the level of questions have been getting much more detailed, right? So two years ago, at, three years ago at KubeCon in Austin, it's what is what is Linkerd versus Istio? And that, that question still continues, but it's a smaller percentage. Now it's more of um, what features do you have? What's, how do you see multi-cluster support happening? Um, what, you know, what does the category look like in the future? Do I need a service mesh? Which is, I think, a, a, a totally valid question. So um, the point there is that the questions are getting more detailed and more um, people are just, I think they're learning more, they're exposed to it more. So in, in, internally, and by internal I mean, internally I mean in my head, and I'm, I'm trying to push this out to my company, is that I'm calling 2020 the year of the service mesh. Because uh, people, I think, are really going to start digging into it, finding uses for it, and um, hopefully making their lives better. That's my ramble. Uh, I would too. I. You know, I haven't pulled on that thread, um, and I suspect there are probably people in my organization who have, and I can ask them and be happy to follow up with you on it. Um, I don't know why. I mean, they were very giving with Kubernetes, so I'm not quite sure why Istio and Knative are not following that trend. But um, at the end of the day, these are companies that are looking also to stay in business and make money and things like that. So. I get it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it should be. Uh, so the question is, when do we have support for TCP, uh, or sorry, MTLS over TCP? Um, that is scheduled for the 2.9 release, which should be Q2 or Q3. Oh, wait, we're in Q2, Q3 or Q4. Yep. We're doing a bunch of work, the underlying work to make it possible to do support for MTLS. And so that involves, again, some of the certificate pieces. And um, there are, 
the team that works on the proxy, um, they, again, their brains are much bigger than mine, and so they could tell you exactly what it is that they're, they're doing in order to make sure that, that um, they can support TCP for MTLS for TCP and that um, it performs, it continues to perform. Yeah. So the last couple of weeks I've been working with one of our community members who is running a Kafka cluster on Linkerd. And so um, yeah, that's all TCP, and so it's been <laughs> it's been interesting to to debug that and work through that. But in once it's released, they'll now have those metrics and you know some some more information about the performance of their application. So um, yeah, fortunately they are they're willing to work with us on it. Well, and I shouldn't say that they're part of the community. Yeah, are, are a lot of you folks involved with open source software? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I should say probably over the last six years I've gotten more into it out of the proprietary world into open source and it's great. It's a fun community. All the community, well, the ones that I work on anyway. As a what admin? As a grumpy sysadmin, is Linkerd going to make you happy? It'll make you less grumpy because my experience with with grumpy sysadmins is nothing makes them happy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we're definitely over time now, um, but I'm happy to stay and answer questions. I really appreciate you all coming. Again, I didn't know what to expect today. I wasn't sure who who would be here. So, uh, again, if you have questions, follow up with me. Um, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff and answer questions and you know I often learn from people who ask questions as well so appreciate it yeah. thank you